So many things that are happening that are good, and we thank God for it. I want to just reiterate a couple of the announcements to make sure that everyone is clear. Uh, again, this Wednesday, we want you to be at our, our business meeting. Um, this is for members, and so uh, perhaps this might be something that nudges those of you who may not have taken that step yet to go ahead and uh, be a part of a new member's experience. And so we want to make sure that you are present. Obviously, we just heard the notification about uh, Minister Gary Cheney, who has been nominated for the Elder Board and celebrate what God is doing in his life and his family. It's important that you know what's going on in your church home. It's important to know where we are, uh, what the direction is for the future, and so please make sure you are here. This is in lieu of Aspire, which is normally on Wednesdays. Uh, so again, we look to see you here in the sanctuary. Also on April 20th, uh, many of you know that we have a youth urban uh, hydroponics program called Cultivate, which is led by Pastor Jason Mims. Uh, and in celebration of Earth Day, they're having, a, having an Earth Day celebration, excuse me, on April 20th, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And uh, you can register. Please, again, look in your bulletin for more information. And those of you who may not have yet had a chance to take a tour of the classrooms where this wonderful work is happening, we encourage you also to reach out so you can take a tour and learn and see what's going on throughout the week. As I stated earlier, it's more than just Sunday. We don't want to just be a Sunday church. Amen. Amen. There's needs, there's opportunities, there's, there's moments to uh, contribute to the well-being of our neighborhood and our city that go beyond what we do here uh, between 10 and perhaps 12 p.m. And so be involved, be informed, and hopefully you also be inspired. I want to invite you to go with me to the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter and... I want to look at chapter 3 initially. Chapter 3, I want to begin at verse 8. We're in a series entitled, A Theology of Suffering. A Theology of Suffering. And it was impressed upon me to highlight what suffering is and to highlight what do we do when we suffer, to highlight where God is in the midst of suffering. Yes, and so in a few moments, we'll review some of our main points from last week, and then we'll go a bit further. My prayer is that the Lord will speak to all of our hearts so that we can be equipped, that we can be informed, but also so that we can be stirred. Let's look to the Word of God. Verse 8 says, I'm reading from the New Living Translations, finally, all of you should be of one mind. Sympathize with each other. Love each other as brothers and sisters. Be tenderhearted and keep a humble attitude. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. Okay, now I'm going to give you a moment to just adjust your seat. <laughs> Peter getting in our business. That is what God has called you to do. And he will grant you his blessing. For the scriptures say, if you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work to maintain it. Oh, come on. Blessed are the peacemakers. For they shall be called children of God. Verse 12, the eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right. And his ears are open to their prayers. But the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. Let's go a little further. Verse 13, now who will want to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. 
So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Remember, it is better to suffer for doing good if that is what God wants than to suffer for doing wrong. Last verse, verse 18. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. I want to speak from the subject today, after. After. Father, thank you for your word. It's anointed because it came from you. Lord, help me to deliver it as you released it. And help every hearer, Lord, to receive what you are saying. Oh God, open our eyes that we may recognize how this word can apply to our lives. Lord, we rebuke even now the devourer, the enemy, who would try to steal the seed of the word. Lord, let the power of the blood preserve us and keep us, that we may learn of you, that we may grow, and that we may flourish as kingdom believers. We thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. After. (laughs) After we have suffered. I want to quote Timothy Keller. Some of you might know of him. He is a a famous, if I can use that word, pastor, author, speaker. And he offers this thought. There's a purpose to suffering. And if faced rightly, it can drive us like a nail deep into the love of God and into more stability and spiritual power than you can imagine. I love that quote because it helps us to recognize that in the Lord, we don't suffer without a cause. Last week, for those who may not have been with us, I raised four questions and addressed all four. Those questions are, what is suffering? Why do we suffer? Is suffering only negative or is it beneficial? And lastly, where is God in the midst of suffering? We defined what suffering is. Uh, there's a couple words in the Greek that we see in the scripture that pertain to, to suffering. Uh, Pathema is the first one. It is a capacity to feel a deep emotion like agony or passion. It is hardship, difficulty, or pain. It is an external misfortune, calamity, evil, or affliction. The next word is pasho. It is to experience a painful sensation or impression. It is to be vexed. It is to undergo something that has a negative effect. The reality is none of us want to deal with none of that. (laughs) So then the question becomes, if, if you and I would say, I don't choose to suffer, the next question is, why do we suffer? Number one, suffering is in our lives because we live in a broken world. Our world has been corrupted by sin. Number two, we suffer because it's the consequence of human sin against God. When we reject the Lord's way of doing things, then there's consequences for that. And in many cases, perhaps all cases, when we go against what God wants, there's a negative consequence. Suffering occurs due to our sinful and wrong choices. Sometimes we look at other people and it's human nature. Go back to Genesis 3. When the Lord held a meeting with Adam and Eve and he began to ask some questions. The first thing Adam did was point to Eve. (laughs) 
and then Eve pointed to the serpent. So what we see here is it is a natural response to project our wrong onto other people. But suffering occurs because of our wrong choices. Next, we suffer because suffering tests our faith. So, okay, let me get this straight. Suffering is in the world, and there's a purpose for suffering. Then what could be the benefits of me suffering? And we began to discuss last week that suffering produces perseverance. It builds character. Suffering helps believers identify with Jesus. I, like many of you, have made many pronouncements in my times of prayer. I, like many of you, have said, Jesus, I want to be just like you. Well, if I'm going to be just like Jesus, it's not just the highs. It's also the lows. Paul says, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection, but also the fellowship of his sufferings. Suffering helps us to identify with Jesus. And if that's true, then I guess we could also say that suffering is a gift. (laughs) Suffering can help us learn more about God. It It can help us to learn more about ourselves. The key is, will we suffer well? Will we suffer well? Another question that we raised was, where is God in the midst of suffering? (laughs) Where you at, God? Where is God when I'm going through? When the difficulty comes and the hardship presses down upon me, where, where are you, God? All of us have asked that question at some point in time. Where are, you, where, where are you? Well, here's the simple response. He's with you. <laughs> I know that might sound too simple for a lot of complicated situations. But the truth is, he's with us. And we see this demonstrated at the cross. Whether they realize it or not, at that time, the world was suffering. Right? The, the, the cruelty of the Roman Empire was a form of suffering. The, the, the people that they conquered and even that which the Jews was enduring all was a form of suffering. So where was God? Where was the God of the Hebrews? Where was the God of the Bible? He was right there with them. He took on humanity so he could feel what humanity feels. He was right there with them and he's there with us in the midst of suffering. Now I want to raise... I want to raise a a point uh, very briefly. How many of you have taken tests before? How many of you like tests? (laughs) So, so, So here's a revelation for you. When we say, God, where are you in the midst of suffering? We have to keep this in mind. The teacher doesn't leave the classroom when he or she administers the test. The teacher is actually in the room, but the teacher is silent. Look at this picture. (laughs) He's there while they're going through the test. He's just not saying anything. Why? Because he's watching. He's watching you prove yourself. He's watching you prove your faith. He's watching you demonstrate what you actually said when you lifted your praise unto him. Oh, yeah. For God I live, for God I die. Okay. The teacher is always silent. Why the test is being taken. That's tough. But he's there. Peter says later in chapter 4, don't be surprised by these fiery trials 
that come to test you. The Lord is proving us. It's our opportunity to arise. It's our opportunity to demonstrate that we actually have the word in our hearts that we've been saying we have in our hearts. Let's keep going. Here's a different question. We didn't address this question last week, but I want to advance it today. What do I do while I'm suffering? Isn't that a good question? Okay. Now, I just made this list, and I invite you to get your cameras on your phones and take this picture. Now, I don't believe this is an exhaustive list, but I was perusing the scriptures, and I wanted to give you all some ammunition because I know that there's some people in here going through some form of suffering, right? Here's the reality. Either, either you are uh, in the middle of a storm, <laughs> you might be at the beginning, right? Or you might be in the middle of it going through, or you're coming out. <laughs> but the reality is all of us are going to encounter a storm at some point. So we might as well be equipped to help us to know what to do. What do I do while I'm suffering? Cast my cares on the Lord. He cares for me. He will sustain me. How many of you know I will run out? <laughs> Resist the devil. Right? You know those depictions in cartoons where you got an angel and you got a devil on one shoulder? We got to resist the evil one. While we suffer, we worship. The Bible says after Job got all those bad messages, the bad news, he lost his children, he lost his home, he lost his servants, he lost his animals. The Bible says Job fell to the ground and worshiped. What do I do while I'm suffering? I fix my eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith. What do I do while I'm suffering? I reject anxiety. Because the Bible says, be anxious for nothing. What do I do while I'm suffering? I got to think about heavenly things. I got to think on those things that are pure and true and noble and holy and of good report. And if there's anything praiseworthy, think on these things, the Bible says. What do I do while I'm suffering? I got to wait on the Lord. It says, even youths will grow weary. But they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. What do I do while I'm suffering? I got to encourage myself in the Lord. The Bible says that at the, after Ziglag, uh, uh, all of David's family was kidnapped and the family of his compadres and his companions were kidnapped and they burned the town. The Bible says David, he looked around because the people that were with him turned to him and started blaming him. They wanted to stone him. David was all by himself. And what did David do? The Bible says David encouraged himself in the Lord. Sometimes... It's not about who you can get on the phone. Sometimes you have got to encourage yourself. Remind yourself what God said. Remind yourself about his promises. What do I do while I'm suffering? I really have no other choice, so I might as well give myself to the Lord. I can't change the situation anyway. So what do I do? I got to give myself to him. I have to entrust my heart with the Lord. I got to entrust my mind. I got to entrust my loved ones. Whatever the situation is, I have to give myself wholly to him. That's what Jesus did. The Bible says he was agonizing in the garden. Oh, he was scared, you all. He did not want to go to the cross. In Hebrews 5, 7, it says that he pleaded with tears to the only one who was able to save him. Oh, yeah, you might have to cry. Oh, you, 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 you may have to shout. You might have to raise your voice. Lord. But whatever you do, give yourself completely to God. So these are some 
recommendations that I offer to you if you are suffering or when you suffer. So this is some background to help us have a baseline around suffering. Now what I want to do is take us to the scriptures to look at some examples in the Bible uh, of individuals who suffered, but they suffered well. I, I want to look at Saul, who became Paul. I love the fact that God can change our nature. So if you're watching or you're here, and, and, and you, you, you don't know the Lord, and perhaps you find yourself in a pattern of behavior that you know is not good, it's negative. Listen, the Lord is a transformer. He was, he's the first transformer. He will transform your life. Do you know that Saul's name means the destroyer? <laughs> He, he changed from being a destroyer to somebody that was a liberator by preaching the good news about Jesus and his kingdom. Saul was changed. Let's look to the scriptures. Acts chapter 9, if you go with me, please. I want to begin at verse 19. Verse 19. Now, some context. Saul was on a mission to arrest Christians in Damascus. He is apprehended by the Lord Jesus on the road to Damascus. Jesus arrests him and lets him know, I got a different plan for you, different purpose for you. He sends a believer named Ananias to help Saul, to pray with Saul. And immediately the Bible says, Saul began to preach the gospel. Can I just say, Paul, it don't take a long time. If you surrender to the Lord, come on, he will activate you with what you know about him. If all you have is your testimony about how he saved you, then guess what? Tell your testimony. Saul began to preach. Let's, let's look at verse 19. It says, Saul stayed with the believers in Damascus for a few days. And immediately he began preaching about Jesus in the synagogues, saying he is indeed the son of God. All who heard him were amazed. Isn't this the same man who caused such devastation among Jesus' followers in Jerusalem? And didn't he come here to arrest them and take them in chains to the leading priests? 22. Saul's preaching became more and more powerful and the Jews in Damascus couldn't refute his proofs that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. After a while, some of the Jews plotted together to kill him. They were watching for him day and night at the city gate so they could murder him. Ooh. But Saul was told about their plot. 25. So during the night, some of the other believers lowered him in a large basket through an opening in the city wall. See, we don't really like to deal with this word. It's a T word. It is tension. If you ever play tug of war, you're pulling on one end, the other person or team is pulling on the opposite end, right? You, there's a tension in the rope. You can feel it because they're not letting up and neither are you. Christians, by, by, by and large, we don't really like tension. Most of us prefer things to just be comfortable. What am I saying? What I'm saying is there are some situations in life where there's a tension. It's not just gonna be cut and dry. It's not just going to be crystal clear. You got to wrestle with it a little bit. You got to become okay with being uncomfortable in some situations. Now, Saul was doing the work of God. He was doing a good thing. Most of us believe that because I'm doing good, I don't deserve bad. But that's not how life is. There will be people who are pro you. And then there will be people who can't stand you. Guess what? All at the same time. Some of us got them in our families. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's attention. 
I can't go grab my ball and go home just because some people don't like me. As soon as I became a Christian, I declared war on the kingdom of darkness. When I took up the cause of Christ, I became an enemy of the, of the devil. Anybody that's under his influence is my enemy. And because this world is under the influence, Paul says, of the prince of the power of the air, I can expect that there will be people who don't like me just because I'm a Christian. You got a cross around your a gold chain with a cross and they notice that all, all of a sudden they start acting funny towards you. Before they saw the cross, they was all nice and, you know, want to kick it with you. And all of a sudden they see the cross and now they don't even talk to you. Oh, yeah. You, you know, sometimes in the workplace there, 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 there are supervisors who, 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 who profess a different faith. And they know you a Christian. And, and then you begin to notice that, you know, there's certain information that other people get that you don't get. Well, how come I didn't know that? There's people who are pro you and then people who are against you. Now, interestingly enough, the plot was designed to stop the move of God. Hear me, the people are interchangeable. The people will come and go. What Satan is, see, we got to lower our opinion about ourselves. Satan is after what's in you, not so much you. He wants to stop the move of God in your life. Because he knows that this, that this, that this treasure in this earthen vessel is powerful to change lives. So he wants, to, he wants to cause you to buckle in the time of suffering so the move of God can be extinguished. He don't want you to be lit on fire. So he begins to arrange circumstances to stop what God is doing in your life. Doing the right thing does not disqualify you from suffering, saints. In fact, Jesus said this. He said, blessed are those who suffer for doing what is right. Come on, stand for Jesus. Don't tolerate wickedness. Don't be okay with what you know is against the values and the word of God. We need more believers in the public square to stand for righteousness. See, we've been seduced in this pluralistic society to just let people be as they are. Well, the problem is they don't want to let you be as you are. If you begin to say stuff about Jesus, now they want to begin to try to hush you up. They want to begin to try to silence and muzzle you. No, 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 no. In this country, the Bill of Rights says, I have a freedom of religion. Therefore, you can't tell me that I can't talk about my God. Paul is preaching. The enemy plotted to stop him. The Bible says they were at the gate waiting to overtake him. Now, I love how God intervenes. This is why you got to give yourself completely to him. And can I say this? Serving the Lord does come with risk. So you got to be okay with that. You have to reconcile that it's an it's, it's, it's a element of danger with this. You, you, you just, you will lose relationships. Yeah. You, you won't get invited to everything. You have to resolve this in your mind and in your heart. But I love how God intervenes. Real quickly, some messengers told him about the plot, Revelation. When you are going through, the Lord will give you revelation so that you can succeed. Then there was the right timing for his escape. It happened at night. See, some people don't like the nighttime. Oh, but the nighttime is suited for certain activities. Because the Bible says he neither slumbers nor sleeps. So even though I might be inactive or a lot of people slow down, God is still moving and he's still working. So at night was the time of escape. 
Then the Lord had ordained some what Apostle Joshua Selman calls destiny helpers. Other, I like them too. Amen. <laughs> Other believers, they lowered Paul down in a large basket. And here's what I love. Despite the fact that he was contained in a restricted area, there was an opening in the wall. I love that right there. In other words, in the midst of my suffering, there's a way for me to escape. So that what people want to do to me will not succeed. Okay, okay, okay. Let me say it like this. No weapon formed against me will prosper. Why? Because he'll, he'll lead me to an opening in the wall. I'm going to say something now. I'm going to say it at the end, but the only person that can stop you from fulfilling God's will for your life is you. This story proves it. They wanted to kill him for his message. Think about that. That's how potent, that's how electric, that is how dynamic the message of Jesus is that people will be willing to kill you to stop, not, not you from hurting them, but to stop you from speaking. Why? Because there's life in that message. Why? Because there's light in that message. There's, in the beginning was the word, verse 4 says, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. People will begin to see because of the message. It's not over till God says it's over, y'all. <laughs> Go with me to 1 Peter 5. We're moving along at a pretty good pace here. I want to dig into this term after a little bit more. 1 Peter chapter 5, uh, verse 10. Chapter 5, verse 10. So we've already established that suffering is a reality here in the earth. We've already established that there is a purpose for suffering. Now let's look a little bit closely at what Peter says happens after. He says in verse 10, in his kindness God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. So after you have suffered a little while, he will restore, support, and strengthen you. And he will place you on a firm foundation. Let me go to the next verse. All power to him forever. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Somebody say after. after. I'm so glad that there is an after my moment of suffering. Yeah. See, sometimes we go through situations and it seems like it is, it has no end. You look around and you say, man, I don't see when this is going to stop. Right? It's just bad news after bad news after bad news. Misfortune after misfortune after misfortune. Have you ever had a sequence like that in your life where it seems like every time you turn around, it's something. Sometimes families go through situations like that. It's just something. One person passed away. Then the next week, somebody else passed away. I heard Donnie McClurkin say that he had a period where he lost eight relatives in one year. Grief. Just when you start coming out the grief, something else happens. They say when it rains, it pours. But I'm so glad that there is an after. Now the term after is an adverb for my English students. It is a preposition. It can be used as a prefix, a noun, or a verb. But essentially what it means is to follow in time or place. It means, if I use it as a preposition, it means that it's something that is subsequent to an order or a time, an event or an activity. So after we suffer, there is a different experience that we have. But here's the key, I gotta give myself to the Lord. See, if I choose to go it alone, then what God is able to do for me won't be available to me. Why? Because I rejected him already. 
The only way I can receive it is if I repent and acknowledge God, I was wrong. This was the message of the prophets to Judah and Israel for generations. God was saying, come back to me. And the only way they were able to receive restoration is when they repented and they came back to God. If you're going through a period of suffering and you know you've been away from God, the key for you is to repent. <laughs> to repent means to change your mind after. <laughs> After you realize the error of your ways and after you come to a place where you recognize can't nobody do me like Jesus. There's nobody who is the answer. I know they just gave a statue to Allen Iverson and I love his game, but AI is not the real answer. Only Jesus is the answer. There is an after, after divorce. Come on here. After loss of a loved one, after loss of a job, after sickness, there is an after that we can experience. God will step in and he will restore. He will raise us up. He will. <laughs> you know, there's so much instruction that we can get from the scriptures. Yeah. This is why I believe the enemy fights our times to read the word. Yeah. Because the reality is what we need is really already at our fingertips. If we got a phone with a Bible app, it's in our house, it's in our bedroom. It's, it's already there if we just will. Yeah. Yes, sir. Acts 14, 19 through 22. This is very powerful. Now, let me give you some background. So, how many of you, by show of hands, have heard of Paul? Now, remember, he was Saul. The Lord changed him, right? He transformed him. And once he was persecuting the church, now he's a preacher. How many of you have heard of Paul and Barnabas? They were a missionary team. Shout out to those who, who have given themselves to the work of either domestic or global missions. They were sent out by leaders from the church at Antioch in chapter 13 of the book of Acts. And they began to go forth and preach the gospel. And here we find them in chapter 14 doing the work of Jesus. And the Lord was confirming that their words were true by doing signs and wonders through these individuals. Uh, and then they went to a particular place, I believe it was Lystra, and they went there and, and, and they, 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 they healed a man. Paul was preaching. He was preaching powerfully. And he, he was gazing at the audience and he looked upon a person who was crippled from birth. He could not walk from birth. And Paul recognized that this man had faith to be healed. So he said to the man, stand up and walk. And the man responded to Saul, Paul's command and he stood up and began to walk. Pause. Do you recognize one reason that the gospel writers tell us about men who or, or persons who were crippled and began to walk is because it symbolizes the condition of humanity. Sin crippled us from birth. David said, I was born into iniquity, shaping in iniquity. From birth, we are sinners. Unable to walk the way God wants us to walk, crippled. The only way we come to a place of being able to walk rightly is when we hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so it was the gospel that was the conduit to this man's healing. So the people were Gentiles that they were ministering to. They were Gentiles. And the only people in their frame of reference that could, the only ones rather in their frame of reference that could cause a miracle to happen were God's. So if Paul and Barnabas facilitate this person's healing, they must be deity. They must be divine. And so they began to give glory to Paul and Barnabas. They began to get reefs and they wanted to sacrifice a bull to Paul and Barnabas. And Paul and Barnabas are like, no, wait, 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 wait. It wasn't us. It was the God who sent us. <laughs> Yeah, you know, we got to be careful that we don't take glory for ourselves, right? This is why we say, God, may you get all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. No, don't, don't worship us. No, don't have a festival in our honor. No, don't feast on our behalf. No. 
uh, but the people didn't really listen. And, 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 and what happened again is in the midst of Paul and Barnabas doing all this good work for the gospel, in the midst of them being missional in their lifestyle, there were opponents. In today's language, uh, the young folks would call them the ops. <laughs> there were oppositional individuals who followed them from Antioch and or Jerusalem to try to stop, here it is again, the move of God. They were trying to stop Paul and Barnabas from proclaiming this message about Jesus. They began to hate on them. They began to stir up the people and cause them who were once applauding Paul and Barnabas. Now the crowd is against Paul and Barnabas. And here we pick up here, verse 19. It says, but Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. That is the tension that I'm talking about you all. It's not comfortable. Yes, you could be doing the will of God and yes, two things could be true. You can be hated by many when all you're trying to do is the right thing. And guess what? If you find yourself in that predicament, guess what? You're just like Jesus because he was stretched out on a cross doing the right thing. But guess what? They still nailed him. They still pierced him. The fellowship of his sufferings. Let's look at this in a little bit of a list fashion. I want to really help us to see what happened here. Again, in a recap, Paul was preaching the gospel. The man got healed. Enemies turned the crowd against Paul. They stoned and dragged Paul and left him for dead. Then the believers gathered around Paul. Paul rose up and resumed his mission. Paul and Barnabas preached and made disciples in Derby. Paul went back to all the places. That's a typo. Paul went back to all the places where he suffered and strengthened and encouraged the believers. So, after we suffer, God wants us to keep on going. But here's what I love. Here's why you need to be a part of a local church. Oh, let me take my new glasses off so I can... <laughs> for, for all those individuals, and I don't say this with comedy, because I know there are persons who have experienced some harm. I don't mean to be insensitive, but I do mean to be truthful. Although you might find relief because you come away from the institutional church, that is not God's design. Why? Because the, the church, the local church, is a resource for you. When you are not strong enough on your own, See, what I love about this story, you all, is that Paul rose up because the believers gathered around him. Oh, yeah. Come on. You need the saints. Now, I don't know what they were doing at that moment. They, I would imagine they started to pray for Paul. I would imagine they began to speak positive things. I don't know for sure, but what the scripture says that he didn't rise again until they gathered around him. When you are going through a time of trial, difficulty, or hardship, you need some folks who will gather around you. <laughs> Come on, you need a prayer warrior or two or three. You got to be in community because if they did not gather around Paul, he would have died. And there's some folks, listen, you will die on your own. You need the saints. Let, let me give you a little secret. 
God works through imperfect people. So we got to stop looking at people from the outside. We all make mistakes. They gathered around him and he rose. And here's what I love. He returned. Let's go. Let me, let me go to the next, next verse. Acts 1-3. Let me just share this with you. Acts 1-3, media team. This is Jesus. It says, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. See, Satan wants you to roll over and die. Satan wants you to stay in your house and disconnect yourself from community. But listen, if God allows the setback, he's preparing you for an amazing comeback. See, if I stay away, I'm really acknowledging defeat. But when I show back up, you did your best to stop me. But as you can see, I'm not dead. <laughs> oh, come on, get back, get back. You don't know me like that. If I could quote Bishop Larry Trotter, I would say, you can tell the devil I'm back. After you suffer, you need to show back up and say, I'm still going to stay on mission. I'm still going to serve Jesus. I'm still going to trust him. I'm still going to believe him. Come on, put your hands together. Oh, yeah. Oh, come on, look at somebody and say, I'm back. <laughs> I'm back. He did his best to stop me. He did his best to silence me. He did his best to discourage me. Oh, but God was with me, and the saints were there to help me. <laughs> I'm not out of here. I'm back. I'm still standing, and it's by God's grace. I'm still here. Can I pause for a second and say right now I'm looking at some miracles? Because despite what you've been through, guess what? You are still here. Come on, somebody say after. <laughs> You're here because there is an after. Some of you have been through hell and high water. But guess what? God is good to you. God is faithful. God is merciful. God is gracious. And because of his love, I'm back. Oh, yeah. When they release me from the hospital, I'm back. When I know they've been talking about me, I'm still going to show up because I'm back. I'm almost done. I got just a couple more points to share. <laughs> Come on, your, your suffering was not meant to stop what God is doing in your life. But your suffering is meant to perfect those things that concern you. That, that suffering that he's allowing is to prune you so that you can bear more fruit. Do you know that when, when agriculturalists prune uh, uh, plants and they prune fruit trees and so forth, they have to cut? And the last time I checked, cutting doesn't feel good. Somebody say after. after. Don't shut down when you suffer. That's what the enemy wants you to do. What is shutting down looks like? Shutting down looks like I stop coming to worship service. Shutting down means I quit my team. <laughs> Shutting down means that I, I stopped talking to the people that was there for me. You know, we start to get amnesia. Yeah. 
Shutting down means that I, I don't open my word anymore. I've lost confidence. Because if God loved me, why would he allow me to go through this? So I, 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 I give up my confidence in his word so I don't read my Bible no more. Shutting down means that when I, I once was coming to prayer, I don't come to prayer no more. Because I prayed and nothing changed. <laughs> so why should I keep on praying? Don't shut down. But I advocate that instead of shutting down, you should surrender to Jesus. Shine. Share. And serve. Come on, repeat that after me. Surrender. Shine. Share. Serve. Again, surrender. Shine. Share. Serve. That's what Paul and Barnabas did. Come on. They, I know in the culture they talk about people being dragged. They literally dragged him and left him for dead. But he went right back to the very place where they drug him. You know why? Because the souls were more important than the stones. He was more concerned about people getting saved and knowing the, the, the precious gift of the Lord Jesus Christ than he was concerned about getting stoned by people who were his opponents. We have got to get to the place where the mission of Jesus Christ means the world to us. We've got to get to the place that obeying my Lord and Savior means more than my feelings because my feelings are subject to change. How much does Jesus really mean to us? Oh, I can imagine all Paul was trying to figure out is, man, I'm, I know I'm hurting, but I can't wait till I get right in my body because I got to go back. It's some people depending on me. It's some people watching me. So I got to show myself alive. Yeah, I'm hurting right now. But if I don't show up, my loved ones might not believe that God can. So I'm not going to just think about myself in this moment. I got to think about my children. I got to think about my siblings. I got to think about those that I've witnessed to. They need to see that I could go through the worst of men, but God can bring me through it. The world needs to see. They need to become witnesses. Oh, come on, Lazarus died. Jesus raised him from the dead. And Lazarus became a wonder. He became a symbol of what God's power is able to do. Come on, God is, God is allowing it in your life so that you can be a living testimony, so that you can be an epistle known and read of all people. God wants you to be the proof that he is. In the midst of a culture that's asking the question, Christian, where is your evidence for God? You and I need to be able to say, you're looking at it right here. So shout out to the worship team because they had us singing a song that said, I could have been dead, but you've been better than good to me. <laughs> could have lost my mind. But you've been better than good to me. <laughs> oh, come on, just lift your hands right here. Lord, I'll trust you. Lord, I'll believe you. Lord, I will stand. Lord, I will stay. Oh, come on, you might have to shout it out. But God, I trust you. Woo! Ah. Oh, it's okay, Sister Penny. Come on and praise him. Go ahead and praise him. Jesus is the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. Can I tell you a secret? He never lost a battle. Can I tell you another secret? He will never lose a battle. The God I serve is the undisputed. He is indomitable. He is inexhaustible. He is unassailable. He is incomprehensible. 
Jesus! 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 He is! Come on, put your hands together. I, 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 I wish somebody would just recognize that you might be in a battle. It might look like you're surrounded. But can I tell you, there are more for you than there are against you. We dwell amongst a cloud of many witnesses. I see Abraham. I see Eliza. I see Isaac. And I see Jacob, and they're looking at me, and they're looking at you, and they're saying, keep going, keep running, keep holding on, keep believing. God will make a way. God will make a way. Come on, put your hands together. Somebody say after. Come on, it's not over yet. After. Yeah, it's life after this. It's life after this. Oh, I just want to go one step further. Can I go one step further? See, the mystery of the cross. We see most of us missed it. Because we only really celebrate resurrection, many of us, on Resurrection Sunday. But here's the mystery of the cross. The message is 24-7. 365 or 366 years, days of the year. The mystery of the cross is that no matter what I go through, even if it brings me to the point of death, there's life after death. Though he slay me, yet will I serve him. Yet will I trust him. There is life after death. There is life after suffering. There is life after misery. There is life after my down days. There is life after my sad days. Jesus! If you believe there's life after this, give them some praise right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh. Now, this is how we're going to end today. Remember that I said that Paul was able to escape because some other people lowered him down an opening in the wall. And then I said that there were some saints some disciples that gathered around Paul when he was in his worst situation. So here's what I want to do as we get ready to go out. If you are in a situation right now where you feel like I've been stoned, you feel like I've been dragged, you feel like they left me for dead. In other words, I'm suffering, Pastor, right now. I want you to come to the front now. Wait for the instruction. If you're going through right now, I want you to come to the front. But here's what, here's what I want to happen. I need some saints to gather around those folks who come to the front and begin to pray and intercede. Begin to release the will of God over them. Begin to declare this, this is not unto death. But even if you do, guess what? There's a resurrection for you. Begin to declare you will not be defeated, but you will have victory. Can we do that? Here's it once again. If you are going through a difficult time right now, I want you by faith to come to the front. But then I need some believers to circle around these folks and begin to pray that they would rise up, begin to pray that they will go back, that they will return. Come on, they're coming to the front. Come on, they're coming. I need some believers. Come on. 
I need some men. Gather around these folks. Come on, touch and agree. Touch and agree. Come on, surround them. Surround them. Brother Bandy, can you come? Hold on one second. I want to make sure we get everybody that came for who needs to be surrounded. We got some space over here too. We can spread out a little bit. I don't want to miss anybody. It, there's some more saints than this. Stop thinking that I got to have a title. If you are a believer, somebody needs your prayers right now. I want you to come to the front and surround these men and women. Come on, don't wait. Somebody pray for you. It's your opportunity to give back. Come on, I need some more prayer warriors. This is not enough. Come on, there's some people up here. They're hanging in the balances. They need God to give a breakthrough. I need some more people. Come on. Okay, y'all can go back. I need some more saints. Pray. 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 In Jesus' name, you will live. In Jesus' name, you will overcome. In Jesus' name. Oh, Jesus, do it for my brother. Do it for my sister. Do it, God. Do it, God. Do it, God. Oh, well, come on, church, pray. Come on, pray. Come on, the prayers of the righteous availeth much. The fervent prayers of the righteous, they avail it much. Something happens when we pray. Chains fall off when we pray. The dead rise when we pray. The lame walk when we pray. Come on and pray. Oh, come on, he's doing it for you. Come on, he's doing it for you. Come on, he's doing it for you. Come on, Karen. Come on, Karen. Jesus. Break through. Break through. Oh, come on, God is doing it. He will restore. He will strengthen. He will revive. He will establish you. He will cover you. He will renew you. God will. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. The gates of hell will not prevail. Come on, God's got it. Come on, God's got it. He's a deliverer. He's a healer. He's a savior. He's a restorer. God can. God will. God can. God will. Oh, come on, let him do it. Come on, Johnny. Come on, Johnny. You a man of glory. You a man of strength. You're a man of power. Jesus. 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 A new level. Yeah. Come on. I won't break. 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 Jesus! Yeah, 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 keep it high, keep it high, keep it high. Keep it high. Keep it high. Keep it high. We praise you for victory. We praise you for deliverance. We praise you. We praise you. We praise you, God. 
We bless you, God. We thank you, God. We honor you, God. Yeah. Yeah. It's not over. It's not over. It's not over. Victory, 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 victory. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Come on and give him praise. Come on and bless him. Come on and honor him. Yeah. The devil thought he won, but God. The devil thought he had me, but God. Jesus, we praise you. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Yes, God. Travis, Travis, come here, please. Hold on one second. I need a whole bunch of men. I need a whole bunch of men. I need a whole bunch of men. Come on, Brother Derek. Surround our brother right here. This right here, just surround him. I need some folks right here. Fill in this space right here. Fill in this space. All around him. Come on, just stretch your hands. In the name of Jesus. Come on, this would it this would it need to look like in our community right here. When men start to do this again, our city will be healed. Yes. Come on, I want somebody just to take the lead in praying for our brother right here. God's got a, a, a amazing plan for his life. And we agree right now yes, that Travis will fulfill God's purpose for his life. Yes, brother Gary, just take the lead on that prayer. Just pray for him. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you. Yes, Glory to your name, God. Hallelujah. We thank you, Father, for Holy Ghost synergy right now. Let your will be done. Let your will be done. Let your will be done. Oh, God, the tears are purging. The tears are cleansing. The tears are releasing. Thank you for freedom, God. No more heaviness. Freedom. No confusion. Freedom. Yes, Lord. Come on, you got a band of brothers. You got a band of brothers. You are not by yourself. You are not alone. God will supply. He will supply. You got help in the back. You got help in the front. You got help on all sides. The Lord. Hallelujah. The worship team is going to sing a song. God is moving. God is healing and restoring. The song simply says, I need you to survive. He never calls you to walk this walk on your, on your own. You don't have to do it by yourself. We need each other. We're God's family. You're my sister. You're my brother. We need each other. I need you. If you know us, sing the song. You need me. We're yes. all apart. We're all a part of God's body. Stand. Stand with me. Agree with me. Agree with me. We're all.
who are here at the altar to remain. Thank you. If you came to pray with someone, thank you so much. You may not even realize it, but you just contributed to somebody who was maybe going to give up. But your prayers, your touch, help them to break through and to keep on going. Help them to know that there's life after suffering. I want to pray a prayer of benediction and release you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. God bless you, church family. On site and online, we love you with the love of the Lord. Go in peace. Have a wonderful Sunday. We'll see you at the business meeting by God's grace. Amen.